one of the tools I use when trying to illustrate for people the, the challenges we face in, in analyzing risk as a profession. I use this bald tire scenario as a, as a way to drive home a couple of important points. So what I do is I describe in four simple stages a scenario, a risk scenario, and ask the audience to think about at each stage how much risk is represented by what I described. In the first stage, picture in your mind a bald car tire. and It's so bald you can hardly tell it ever had any tread on it. So think to yourself, all right, how much risk does that represent? Okay. So the second stage is the bald tire is tied to a rope hanging from a tree branch. So it's a tire swing. And so how much risk is associated with that? And then the third stage, you look a little more closely and you see that the rope is frayed about halfway through, right below where it ties to the tree branch. So how much risk is associated with that? And then finally, you see that it's suspended over an 80-foot cliff with sharp rocks below. So how much risk is associated with that? And when I ask people at that last stage to say, you know, is that high risk, medium risk, low risk, whatever, almost invariably I get an answer, well, it's high risk, you know, someone could fall to the rocks below if that rope broke. But exactly as described, there's very little risk because I haven't described an asset of any real value. I haven't described a human being on the swing or kids playing in the area or anything like that. That's an assumption people make. And that's kind of the first point I try to drive home with that scenario is, you know, a big part of risk analysis in our field or any field has to do with assumptions. What is it exactly we're analyzing? What are the key factors or variables in play in the scenario? And at each stage in that scenario, when it was just this bald tire that I mentioned, people are thinking, ah, oh, wet roads and automobiles with people in it and such, that's bad, right? And then all of a sudden, second stage, it's a tire swing. So that's not so scary, right? And then, well, third stage, there's a frayed rope, and that, you know, question marks begin to arise in people's heads about that. And then the last stage, warning bells go off when I mention the cliff and rocks and that sort of thing. But, but the point is, at each stage, based on different information, they made different assumptions and had a different sort of level of concern. And the same thing is true in our world. I mean, if someone says, oh, we've got an Internet server that is, you know, has lots of vulnerabilities in it. You know, oh, warning bells go off. Well, you know, what's the value or liability characteristics of the of the uh, system or the application? What um, what kind of threat pressure is is it under? These sorts of things. Are there compensating controls? There's a whole lot of information that needs to be considered before you can have a defensible risk analysis associated with it. So, the point is, bottom line, assumptions are, are critical and. One of the advantages to FAIR is that the framework uh, is a framework for critical thinking and surfacing and for surfacing assumptions and opening those assumptions to dialogue and debate and examination so that at the end of the day, it'll stand up when somebody starts poking and prodding it. And the fact that people have varying answers to the fundamental question about the scenario is a big problem. I mean, if one person's threat is another person's vulnerability is another person's risk, that's a horrible starting point for any analysis or, or communication about risk. We can't agree on foundational terminology. And if we can't get that straight, then everything else is a crapshoot. You know, um, the mental models people operate from in their risk analysis, you know, it's medium or whatever the case might be, has a horrible starting point um, because of foundational definitions and terminologies where FAIR um, helps or one of the ways in which FAIR helps is it provides clarity around terminology and, and a way to normalize terminology so when people are having a dialogue they aren't having to experience the confusion and misunderstandings that go along with one person's definition is completely different than someone else's and it also the model provides a way to identify what your assumptions are and surface those so they can be examined and, um, and reconciled, if you will.